This week, in the podcast episode, it is like when two worlds collide. Uh, we're going to be talking about some specifics around the shoulder, but then some specifics around breathing and how those two things interact. Um, those of you that have been paying any attention to um, what me and Tim have been up to a little bit individually um, will have noticed we have been dipping our toes into and taking some deep dives into a couple of different areas but actually we're looking at how those two elements of breathing and your shoulder performance um, collide or combine together and uh, there's going to be some interesting takeaways for people um, particularly if you haven't come across any of this stuff yet. Sometimes in the intros I feel like we we tell you too much about what's going to come up so I'm going to be disciplining myself today I'm not going to tell you any more because we are going to get into the detail of it but I'm going to segue this quite skillfully into thanking our podcast sponsors Spartan Race because one thing you're going to need on a Spartan Jacko is a good pair of shoulders and a good <laughs> pair of lungs so I think that this would be a good episode for people who are going to come and join us on the Spartan Race Jacko and I are going to be doing and actually the School of Calisthenics team is going to be at the Midland Spartan Race on the 16th of July. Now, I can't do the Sunday, which is the 5 and 10k option, which means by default <laughs> we are tackling the beast. 21 kilometres of obstacle racing gloriousness. Uh, we're going to be there, and you can also join us, and it's going to cost you absolutely nothing. Yep, there is um, the opportunity for a free space. There are only 50 of them, the free spaces, um, and I think the beast one is like, 90 quid or something if you were having to pay yep. you don't have to pay put your wallet away this one's a freebie this one's on us well it's on the podcast sponsors uh, so big thank you to spartan just saying that you can join any of the races so there's like the, like tim said there's a five there's a ten but also there's a whole host of races going on all over the country throughout the year so you can use the code on any of those races but we'd love it if you came and actually joined in with us uh, the things that you have to do the few little uh, loops uh, that you have to jump through or hoops that you have to jump through are there's a little bit of um, Instagram uh, engagement. You need to, to prove that you are actually going to turn up and you're doing some training in order to, to take part in the Spartan. So we want to see a photo or a video or something of you in your training for your Spartan race. And the things you need to tag, you need to tag Spartan. You need to use hashtag, so that's at Spartan. You need to tag Sp hashtag Spartan race and then tag us, School of Calisthenics, and then send that post picture video whatever it is um in a dm to us so we can see it validate it and then we will send you your free code which works on the spartan race website uh like i say for any race but we'd love it if you joined us on the 16th of july and that can be a feed post or a story jack or anything can't it just some set, record it send it to us we'll see it and you get the access so Come and join us. And if if, like, if you can't, if, if you if like me, you are somewhat concerned about the the, the, the beast and what's involved. I don't know. I literally <laughs> know nothing that's involved. Really, um, the website doesn't tell exactly what you're going to be doing for 21 kilometres. But if you don't want to come on the Saturday, I'm sure there'll be some lots of other people who might be looking to get together on the Sunday for for a five or 10k. Or this, as Jacko says, lots of events around the country. So don't be put off um, if you think 21 kilometres is a long way. I'm I am put off, and I think it's a long way, but I'm still going to do it anyway. And it's not going to be that pacey. So if you want to come with us and just have a little trot around, all the reasons. Yeah, there's been I've been answering a number of questions this morning around. Um, I'm not very fast. Is it okay? I'm going to be at the back. So don't worry. We we we, we it, slow and steady wins the race on these types of things. Um, there's no medals. Yeah. Well. There probably is a medal, but you know what I mean? Like, you get, like, a, a really cheap medal at the end of these things, don't you? But <laughs> I'm not doing it if, it's, if I don't get a medal. That's what I'm doing it for. All right, sit back and enjoy this week's podcast. We're going to talk about breathing and shoulders and how they play quite a, an important role of working together that you, you may or may not have come across before. So here we go on this week's podcast. Roll that jingle. Listen. Players, <laughs> you're listening to the Movement, Strength and Play podcast by the School of Calisthenics. Here are your hosts, Tim and Jacko. Right, we're going to get a little bit technical. So we're going to zoom out to zoom in and then we're going to look at all the parts in between. So the integration between... Let's, we're going to talk specific, specifically about the shoulder, but I'm going to wind it back a little bit before we do that. And then I'm going to let Jacko pick up on his area of expertise, which is going to be around ribcage mechanics and diaphragmatic breathing particularly. And he's probably going to take us down a few rabbit holes along the journey there as well. 
let's just kind of contextualize this as to why you, you're thinking what the hell has a shoulder got to do with the diaphragm and breathing well actually it's quite a significant relationship if we go big picture think about your spine and your the shape of your spine is going to determine the, the position of your rib cage and now your rib cage is then going to play an important role in articulating with the scapula so the bone sitting on your shoulder blade sitting on the back of your scapula Think about that as the train and the rib cage is the tracks. Now we need the scapula to sit on the rib cage so that the scapula basically has a guide of how it's going to move down, upward, downward rotation, elevation, depression, all the things that scapula can do. So if the scapula is moving well and it sits on the rib cage, it gets the opportunity to then go through really good controlled range of motion because it has the tracks to move on. And the scapula is there to support the humerus, the, the bone in your upper arm. That creates what we commonly talk about as our shoulder joint, and it is the shoulder's job to position the hand. So anything that we want to do from a technical perspective, or, or sorry, a functional perspective in life is going to be involving where we want to put our hands the shoulder's job is to position the hand so if we feed all of that back and go if we've got a problem with our rib cage position or rib cage function that can have a significant impact on scapula and therefore shoulder function and that's when we are now training moving all those things start to play into the mix and we can potentially find that there could be some problems which could be causing some issues around performance um outcomes jacko did i do a good job of teeing up a conversation for today <laughs> you certainly did you i'm anyone watching on the youtube will see that i'm bobbing along because there's a, <laughs> because because there's a song in my head and um for anyone that doesn't like things being too technical we can summarize all of that by following along with the children's song the rib cage is connected to the <laughs> backbone. The backbone's connected to, and but this is this is I, I, I joke about this sometimes when I'm like presenting on it because we forget or just don't really think about like the rib cage, the ribs as we know they're like bones, but we don't think of like joints. And you've just been talking about the scapula, like articulate on the rib cage, but we don't. But then we have this like. I always think of this image of you go into a you don't do it these days because you don't go into a doctor's office, do you? But um, back in the day, they're they do they? What, <laughs> telephone consoles. So like, yeah, I've got this thing. I go to my trousers now, so you can have a look at it. <laughs> I've got this thing that you need to see. <laughs> I don't want to do it on my phone. <laughs> it's not the same, <laughs> mate. Is this is this normal? <laughs> um, have you got one of these on the end of yours? Oh, sorry, I, that was I was on Instagram. <laughs> Just, uh, I was live then. From sorry. Anyway, well, this is going? this wasn't the rabbit hole I thought we were going down. But I was going to say that the, um, when you were allowed to go to a, 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 an enter the, a, doc, a, a doctor's office, there would be um, like a skeleton, not like a real person, as in like a plastic. And when you look at like a skeleton, and when you look at like the rib cage part of it, you don't look at that and think, "Oh, but that moves." Whereas, you know, we know our arms and things move. And um, how your ribs move influences the position of the rib cage, like you and like we're saying. And, and um, the movement of your ribs will influence the, uh, the function of the diaphragm, which we'll go and talk about, like, how that's then going to affect everything else. But very, like, from just that top level of it, as you described, of, like, the scapula is moving on the rib cage. And so the position of your rib cage will affect that. What's and we don't have to be an expert in anything to go. Ah, oh, I bet how I breathe like will influence my rib cage. Or just even without the if, if however wherever you're sat down now, listen to this or whatever you're doing to listen to this. Like you can just move your spine and put your hands on your ribs, and you can feel that like when I move my spine, like my ribs move. Those things are connected in together. Um, what's interesting around. Um, some of the rotational patterns as well is that like in order for us to like move that spine um, which will you know spinal position affecting like shoulder function for me to be able to move my spine and rotate and flex and things around my spine like the ribs themselves have to move um, and this for me when I'm looking at like how breathing influences like movement from a performance perspective um, it's one bit that for me has just been like oh wow like it's so sort of simple and obvious when it's sort of pointed out um, and then you can actually make some really nice changes when you start to like just position the ribs a little bit better or get them moving a little bit better on your inhalations and your exhalations. And we can yeah, talk about a few of those little bits. But just as a as a baseline, you can always finish the podcast there with a certain degree of just going like an understanding or just an appreciation of like, OK, where I put my ribs, which is influenced by how I hold my posture, but as well as how I actually breathe 
is going to influence my shoulder. And when we're talking about yeah. doing some cool stuff in calisthenics, particularly like the overhead positions, your ability to get your, your scapula upwardly rotated in a nice position on the ribcage is massively going to affect your shoulder function and your handstand and your flags and whatever other things that you're or just reaching yeah. up to grab that cup of coffee. And if, how effectively in those, like, let's take the handstand position as a great example. Like, if you've got the, let's, let's I'm going I'm to give you an applied example, Jack, or a case for you to, to talk mm. us through. But if we're getting into that upward rotation position, so remember when the hand goes overhead, the scapula has to rotate around the ribcage and upwardly and protract slightly. If the scapula is sitting well in a good position against the ribcage, we have stability. And therefore, the, the, the structural integrity of the joint is greater, and that means we're probably going to be able to produce more force. So if we're trying to balance in a handstand position, or if we are trying to create a significant amount of pushing force in handstand push-up movements. And we often see this in people that have got um, a really good example. I'm going to try and segue this in without being too technical, Jacko is sometimes you'll find people who struggle to get overhead range of motion are really stuck down in the thoracic spine. So their T-spine, their mid-back, and they just can't get that extension. Um, and another example, and you can pick whichever one of these mm. you want to go through, Jacko, but I'm thinking whether you could explain to people around that sort of that 360 breathing, because to kind of, if you picture this, that if your rib cage is flared, so you kind of like your, your, the front of your rib cage is, is lifted up, so imagine that your um, abdominals are sort of lengthened slightly, then think about what could potentially be happening to where the scapula sits. So the rib cage is now sitting away from the scapula because it's lifted up forwards. So there's something which we often, in, in our breathing mechanics and how we breathe, will then change or could, will influence that rib cage position. And it could be that we not, aren't breathing enough out the back of the rib cage, Jacko, because we're not actually sort of expanding posteriorly through the rib cage, which is going to, in part, help to keep um, the, the, the connection or the integration between the scapula and the rib cage. Am I correct? Yeah, so that you'll get it a lot in um, if someone's got a lot of like extensor tone. So we we we've seen it a lot in um, the rugby players that we work with, where we're doing a lot of posterior chain work, and then we have that like more sort of like anterior tilt of the pelvis and that shortening of the space at the at the back. And then you see on the front side, we see the the ribs um, flared out, and those ribs flaring out. Um, uh, slightly more technical than my children's song that the if you if someone locates their two lowest ribs like dig down with your fingers and find your two lowest ribs they're they're at an act they create an angle and reach your sternum your breastplate that angle is called the infrasternal angle and that widening of them is part of like the inhalation we want that infrasternal angle to widen for those ribs to um extend and externally rotate effectively um and when we do that, that's what's supposed to happen with that, that rib articulation on an inhale that they're moving outward laterally and in, in, in like three dimensions in all dimensions. But it's that lateral movement um, that we're going to that we're going to sort of focus on. Um, and then people that get stuck in too much extension is that they're almost like well, the easiest way to think about it is that they can't do the opposite of that. And, and quite simply, the opposite of inhaling is, is exhaling. So the, the ribs are flat. The, the position they're in, in that extension from all that tone at the back, is keeping the ribs up and out. And they don't actually then be able to get them down and in, um, which would be like internal rotation um, flexion. So those ribs coming back and down together is key in allowing the diaphragm to go back to a resting shape. So the diaphragm is attached, attaches to the spine at the back and attaches onto the front of those lower ribs. And if those ribs are pulled out, it's literally like pulling the diaphragm apart almost, if you think of it like that, is in, in keeping tension in there. And the diaphragm doesn't get to relax until those ribs actually come back and down together. It's very difficult to get your ribs back and down together if you're in an extended position. And so it's a, there's, a, there's a little bit of like, you know, sort of chicken and egg, what came first, but um, just addressing some of that, some of the, the function around the breathing, because that's happening just all the time in the background rather than the one exercise you might do in the gym can often help relieve some of those, some of that sort of like position people are holding in their posture and then some of that um, sort of excessive tone that they're getting in those extensors. So what's important around, around all of that from the diaphragm perspective is that if you're not able to um, get those ribs down effectively in an exhale, your diaphragm's just forever being like, pulled and, and stretched and having sort of I just think of it as like or explain it as having residual tension in there that then is going to influence how it functions itself you just think of any muscles like this if your bicep is always slightly tense like your elbow is probably going to be mingos yeah or it's going to affect your shoulder so 
if the if the diaphragm is always under a little bit of tension, then that's going to affect the joints that are around it, say the ribs cage around it, and then it's also going to affect anything that else it's it's attached or influencing. So it's a, it's attached to the spine, um, and then we've got some attachments of um, things like QL. Um, so it's major that come up and fascially connect to the same part of the the spine that the diaphragm does, and so we've got this interplay of like okay, fascially all these tissues are coming together, and if we've got one that's constantly like just a little bit, but it's just doing. If you think of them as if you think of the breath a breath as a rep, we're doing maybe twenty twenty five thousand of those a day. So it's not like oh every time I breathe it just feels absolutely horrendous. No, but if you're just keeping some residual tension just constantly, 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 the sheer number of repetitions that you do mean that if you make those a little bit better and a little bit less tension, like the cumulative effect starts to starts to build up. And um, a lot of the time people will get some release around the hips and stuff as well because of that influence that it's having onto um, those hip flexors. Um, so just it's been... Allowing, cause it... Yeah, we often think that we kind of isolate down to individual muscles, but we remember that everything is wrapped in fascia, and fascia is like working in. I mean, we talk about movement slings, but basically like working mm. in chains and connections to bring everything together, decreasing that tension around the abdominal or the diaphragm, particularly the rib cage, is then going to allow more slack elsewhere in the system, effectively, because it's less wound up. It's creating less kind of pull um, across the chain. Is that correct? Yeah, and then because and then the other element that can be is that people just hold too much tension across their sort of abdominals. Um, and if you think of, if you, if someone, if I was to do a strong exhale now, like a forceful exhale, like, and like put your hands on your stomach, it's like, okay, actually forceful exhalation. That's, that's my ribs coming down and in. It's my, I can feel my core muscle, my abdominal recab is working to once even to, to flex the spine. I've got uh, the obliques working. You can feel those muscles working now what a lot of us have done as too many sit-ups as a kid in our bedroom trying to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger, a.k.a. me. A lot um, of us, a.k.a. you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but also, we may be under the impression, like, to hold myself in good posture, I'm maybe, like, sucking my belly in a little bit, or we're just keeping tension in. And keeping tension in that midsection is then stopping those ribs from actually being able to move out and articulate well enough to allow the diaphragm to function well enough. So... Sometimes we've got these sort of, t if, you know, you get a little bit of everything, but there's some people would notice if you lie down on the floor and you've got a massive arch underneath your back and you see your ribs sticking out of your T-shirt when you're lying down, that's, that's you in that like flared extended position we talked about before. Um, if, you're not if you're holding too much tension on the in uh, around the abdominal region, restricting your breath um, or restricting the movement of your ribs on an inhale to be able to come out, that's going to affect your diaphragm's ability to move down and flatten and, and occupy that space in the um, abdominal cavity. That doesn't mean you're going to die. It just, but the brain will just allow us to like increase the volume inside the thorax another way. So we'll just do a little bit of lifting the rib cage from like the pecs and then or the traps. And it's like, okay, you've got some tightness around here that will affect then your shoulder function as well, because you've got some poor like mechanics of, of how you're breathing, which, you know, Again, what's what's causing that could be a whole host of things, but just an appreciation of, okay, I don't want to be holding tension on the when I'm trying to inhale. The diaphragm, the confusion comes like when you tense your like abdominal muscles, like you can feel it and it's on the outside, and your diaphragm's like in the same sort of area, but it's deeper inside, and it's not work when you're tensing um, and doing like. If you're doing an exhale and you're, you're getting some of that tension from your recab, from transverse ab, from, from obliques pulling down, that's exhaling. The diaphragm's not doing anything during that. The diaphragm's going back to its resting position and it's, it's, all, it's, it's the opposite. It's the inhaling. When actually, when we're inhaling, we want the ribs to be able to move out, so we want the abdominals relaxed. The diaphragm's moving down and flattening out, which is causing the increase in volume inside the thorax to allow air to come in. But that gets that relationship or understanding is just sort of, or there's just some misconceptions a lot of the time for people. And um, if you were to go, right, let's try and tense our diaphragm, we'll just like tense our abs because it's in the same sort of area and we have poor proprioception of the trunk area typically for, for everyone. So there's a, there's a nice learning process to try and just like feel what is it like to use that diaphragm, noticing the difference between it and just noticing what some of your typical breathing patterns and postures are like noticing how 
when I try to improve those a little bit, do I start to see some changes in some residual tension, like you said, elsewhere in the body? That might be around the pecs, chest, the shoulder. Like, does the shoulder start to function a little bit better? Does the does it fit? Do I feel like the scapula is moving a little bit better on the rib cage? And that there's um, the other big one to to when you talk about that upward rotation, and uh, you, you'll talk a lot about like the importance of serratus. Well, and that, again, the serratus is involved in inspiration, but how often is serratus not well? activated or is it inhibited or but just the the role of that is is a is important in breathing but also massively with the shoulder right mm. yeah there's some interesting stuff in there around just um i, I remember because they quoted from dana santas that stuck to me yeah. when we, we had her in the podcast a while ago the mobility maker and she was like breathing is not always a solution but it's always a place to start and i think that's like a really good way to think about this if of is there something because we can go and do some specific work around the shoulder and we can get into some rotator cuff work and but it's often something that i check in with clients before we go and go just tell me a little bit about your breathing i, I work quite remotely now with clients so it's, it's a bit of a difficult one to sort of do like the assessment phases but it's something which we are just becoming more and more sort of mindful with and you can see it often when people do an assessment you can see how they're breathing you can see how they're yeah. moving you can see where the rib cage is sitting from a static posture assessment so sometimes we're sort of talking about, let's just check in on, on, on breathing mechanics. Like, are you aware of how you breathe, blah, blah, blah. Because if we've got a dysfunctional or a less than optimal um, breathing habits, let's kind of put it that way, yeah. then we haven't necessarily got the foundations for the shoulder to move well. So anything that I do around the shoulder could potentially be hindered by the fact that we are like secondary breathing. So as Jacko mentioned, like you've got the, the, the musculature of the upper thorax. Like let's take pec minor as a great example, sitting on the coracoid process, like a little beak that sits on top of your scapula and runs down and connects on ribs three to five. Now, if you're not diaphragmatically breathing, what's going to happen is that pec minor and a group of other muscles around the, the shoulders and the, and the neck are going to start to try and take over. And they're going to try and pull the rib cage up to try and get that diaphragm to work, right? So then we find we get this overdominance of pec minor, which can potentially then start to cause real significant issues around serratus because they actually have quite an intricate relationship where serratus wants to get up and around the rib cage, bring the scapula up and around. Pec minor is a downward rotator and depressor. So when we're trying to get up and around into overhead positions, if pec minor is working too hard, it's pulling the scapula back down in the opposite direction, which is not particularly conducive for good overhead positioning, stability and strength in those, in those shapes. And that all could be driven from secondary breathing or, or accessory breathing where because we're not using the right... Um, breathing techniques so i don't know if you segue into that jack i've got one other mm. point but i'm going to go down a rabbit hole if i go down there around serratus and, and fascial <laughs> connections because it is interesting but it's maybe like level two shoulder breathing mechanics um where do people start with this one in terms of is there something like a simple thing if you're going you know i have my shoulders feel a bit like junky and stuff like i have a few issues i wonder if i don't like what's the kind of like checklist that people could go through as to go and how could i decide or determine if i've got a problem around my breathing mechanics which could be impacting my shoulder and if i can do these things can i do like a test retest and see if it helps yeah yeah um well certainly we can test retest like anything any sort of movement you're trying to uh, get a little bit better like maybe like is that like your shoulder rotation or shoulder flexion extension something around um your shoulder for sure just like do, do to see how how does it feel what's the range like is it is it comfortable is it clunky is it is there any pain or discomfort and what's the actual range like and then we already mentioned like just uh, to start i always start with people with just like awareness getting a bit better awareness of like how you're breathing but also like the position that you're currently in and you use a great word habits like what sort of habits have we got it's not like that you're gonna you have to breathe to stay alive so it's not that if you're doing something a little bit poorly that you just die it's just that you might be in um less efficient at it or if you're being less efficient at it both from a mechanical which then also affects um like the oxygen exchange of the the biochemistry we, we won't go down that rabbit hole but they affect the efficiency of of how well you're breathing how well options being delivered and then that efficiency effectively or the simplest way to think about it is if you're being really inefficient you're gonna to have to do more of it so if i'm having to do more of it the body's doing more work and then if it's doing it uh, having to do more work in a dysfunctional pattern then it's just going to like exasperate the the sort of situation so awareness um as a starting point is uh, is key and we can get some awareness through just some very we already mentioned like if you lie on your back with your knees bent and like what's the position of your like be aware of what's the position of your um of your spine 
What's the position of your rib cage? Can you feel your rib cage or see your rib cage sticking out of your t-shirt at the front? When we're lying on our back, it actually um, a lot of the research shows that like that's the sort of the ideal position for people to learn or to feel the diaphragm moving a little bit more. Um, one of the nice things about lying on your back is that um, you can feel the lower your the, the your lower back onto the floor. So when you breathe in. Can you feel like your lower, abs, uh, lower ribs moving out? And can you actually feel some sensation of, you're not just sticking the belly, pushing the belly up or your chest moving up. It's actually coming from lateral movement of the ribs. And because you're lying on the floor, you're going to get some sensory feedback from the floor on your lower back as well as a, as a starting point. But life doesn't happen lying on your back. So you need to be able to do that, whether you're standing, whether you're sitting down or whatever. Some of the simplest things um, that we can do is, literally use our hands to stimulate some of the uh, some of the skin around those areas that we're trying to get the rib cage actually moving so rubbing those lower ribs on the outside around the back and then just being aware of that area by heightening that um that awareness through that sensory touch and then just being aware that when i breathe in i'm trying to feel that area expand out three-dimensionally when i breathe out i'm trying to feel that coming back together um, th there's other simple things like, you know, putting your hands, one hand high, one hand low to be able to notice, like literally, am I driving from my breath from the upper chest or am I driving it, um, from lower down? Um, anything that's going to get you an idea of like, what does it feel like to actually get some movement coming from lower down there? Um, and one of the things that you'll notice as well is that if you start to be a little bit more efficient with your breathing and allow the body... I believe the body's like designed to, to breathe beautifully and that if we create the conditions and the environment and set it up for success, it will breathe well. Um, we just need a little bit of guidance for that sometimes to let that happen. And when that does, you start to mechanically breathe better or help with the efficiency. And then it's like not only might your shoulder function when you retest feel a little bit better, a little bit easier, like you might feel a little bit calmer in yourself. Your nervous system might feel a little bit calmer and you can just feel a little bit better sort of mentally um as well um so yes yeah. nice. is there anything that you could do so if you're at the beginning of a session so like i think one one of the things that i've hold my hands up and i'm I, I, there'll be a lot of strength and conditioning and personal trainers in the same um space is like if a br breathing drills prior to a workout so if you're going to go into an overhead position like is there something like what's like the biggest bang for your book that you could do to kind of optimize and it could be lower body as well right it's, it's going to be yeah. it would work for both but is there something just like a diaphragmatic warm-up exercise that sits really well at the beginning of a session which is going to give you like let's say 80 percent of a good kick in the right direction to, to try and optimize shoulder function based on, on this conversation um There'd definitely be there's there's some stuff around like just get heightening that that awareness so you know sensory sensory input to like stimulate that area start to be thinking about my my diaphragmatic breathing now just like if somebody's um, if somebody's really struggling to like breathe into that back end they're in a lot of that extension like we can do some you could get into like child's pose and we could start to breathe into the back a little bit but then. We've got the other side of it. If someone's a little bit more in that sort of like rib flare position, then actually we want to work on some some exhalations um, and, and forcing those ribs to be able to come down. Um, it's a, other than trying to breathe diaphragmatically, trying to do do something too specific. That it, it ultimately is going to depend on where that person's sort of where that person's sort of at and where they're. Um, where there where there were sort of restrictions or where they could be improved by well done it depends because that's what yeah. we've, we've not had an, and it uh, depends answer for a while, while. That's good, I felt, uh, yeah um, but yeah it, it just i one think it's an interesting one but just be, yeah yeah no for sure and i think it's I, I was just as you were talking i was like there's definitely um in fitness particularly the f current fitness landscape um I, I would question people that listen to this if they are involved in a kind of a conditioning type program whether that be functional fitness or crossfit or or whatever it might be, or even if you're going out for a run, like this is your, also your by Jacko. But I think there is a massive thing there about being aware of your breathing under greater intensities and what happens because you can actually spend quite a lot of the time during the week when the intensity ramps up, not necessarily, or just trying to get through a workout so you are not necessarily breathing optimally. And could that potentially, therefore, within that session, be having a negative effect on performance? And I know these are a lot of things to think about, but I think just if you are probably, if this is the first time you've ever come across something like this, then you've got some stuff to take away from there. If you've kind of 
are a little bit more familiar with some of the conversations that we've had around breathing before and some of the stuff that Jacko is doing, you can then start to kind of go, well, how do I now start to optimize some of this stuff? And a real simple thing that I've used within, um, within like a, a more of a CrossFit condition type environment is just in between sets or if you're having a break in a, in a workout, like just take three or four kind of like long, deep exhales in between sets just to kind of like bring the system down, just kind of give yourself that time to, to get control of the breath again and then go back into it. Like it's not feasible really to think that all the time that we're going to always be able to to have perfect control over the diaphragm because we're starting to go on red line. Like we're going to have to just go into that state of like we just need to get this work done or whatever it is we're trying to do. But I think I've found Jack, and you can probably come back and tell me if I'm doing this right or not, but just having those checkpoints within a, within a workout as to just re kind of connecting with that breath is actually being really useful. Actually, from a performance perspective, whether it is a parasympathetic tone um, at a, a response yeah. or it's just it is a more of like a, a mechanical response, it definitely helps in that next set, just having that moment of composure. Yeah, there, there'll be... Probably there'll be some neurological, like you say, from the extending exhales is, is going to help with that sort of parasympathetic activity just to try and de-stress the system a little bit, which is getting stressed through the, the session. There'll be a bit of a psychological element to it as well, where we're managing sort of airflow, CO2 plays a role on, on the psychological element too. Um, and then, well, and, and psychologically, mentally, it's giving you something to like focus on that's like present moment and that's, and that's not the session, but you're like internally able to just go a little bit um inward which i think is is beneficial psychologically when you when you're sort of like redlining like you say um and then mechanically you're doing a lot of work on getting those exhales down and, and when we're talking about recovery with from a from a sort of sports performance type of thing our ability to be able to control our exhalations is um in a way, a sign of like control of the breath and that you've actually like getting uh, to a point of recovery and, and, and not having lost our breath. You know, the, the, everyone knows that when you see someone that's just like <laughs> panting like that, they've, they've lost their breath. And when you've lost your breath, you know that you're, you're you, you, until you stop, you're not going to actually, um, you're not going to actually recover. I think that there's a, there's a whole I mean, keeping this episode about like how it can affect shoulder function. Um, there's a whole another avenue to explore around like um, how can we use it to optimize, like you said, performance as well as recovery strategies, um, which probably is a is a is a whole another uh, whole another episode. But it'd be it'd be yeah, it'd be definitely interesting to just explore some of those things. Um, for anyone that's doing any sort of like higher intensity metabolic work or anything like that. But just to pull out one thing for people to, that you, that you said for people to think about is that your day to day breathing might not, the demand of your day to day breathing, like the metabolic demand just sitting there at your computer, isn't going to, um, show up any of the dysfunctions that you might potentially have in your breathing yet. Exercise is a great opportunity to connect with your breath and go, okay, my, this, this, the high intensity, this is, is now starting to expose what are those habits like and what will I go to and how efficient is that and how good is that at, 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 um, at delivering oxygen for me. And so think of using exercise for all the reasons you currently do exercise, but paying a little bit of attention and awareness to like, how does the increase in exercise, increase in metabolic demand, what influence does that then start to have um, on my on my breathing as a as a thing? Because you know you mentioned like when we start breathing from the upper chest, like is that stopping us using the diaphragm? Or, like we have the ability to breathe into those areas, and it's good to be able, like any like motion, it's good to be able to exercise through and take things through a full range of motion. So there's nothing wrong with using those upper chest areas like we want to expand in there when we need to a lot of people are so tight and restricted in there that they actually can't get into there effectively mm. and then the 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 thing that we don't do well when we are like gasping for air is that <sighs> we only feel there rather than if we teach ourselves to start from lower down with the diaphragm and then fill all the way up we actually get a, we have the ability to breathe a much larger breath which you know obviously is going to help you with your Surf performance with your recovery yeah yeah 
But it's changing habits. But let's say let's we can. Uh, that's a that's a different episode to how it's going to affect the shoulder. Good. I, I think I hope I think my kind of desire for the takeaway from from this conversation was just going to be at, at that top level of going. Just understand that it, it, yes, we can talk all we like about exercises for yeah. specific muscles and this that and the other. But I think if you are just check in if you've got a shoulder issue particularly a range of motion issues where we often see this because it, it will th- these things often come together um if you are and then just check in and do that exercise that jack has said around your breathing are you conscious around your breathing um and potentially play around with it a little bit and, and then just do the simple test retest of range of motion movement for the shoulder sometimes it can change it and it's just it the system is is quite adaptable like that in a sense of it will feel a little bit like woo woo and it's kind of like i don't really know what i've not done anything but it does you might get some more range of motion as a result of doing some work on your um on your breathing mechanics so that's the starting point the technicalities of it and go it, once you've kind of got that nailed down for me from a, just a wrap it up from my size of shoulder perspective mm. if you've got people that are breathing well and they've got control they've got awareness of their breath it may not be perfect but that gives us the license then and the opportunity to then just go and focus on the, maybe some more mechanical things what's that exercise prescription because you've kind of got confidence that the underlying one of the underlying rocks if you like what is a potentially could be a root cause to some issues has been ticked off yeah. um and that it doesn't necessarily need to be at that point like a really arduous oh, i've got to do all of this sort of stuff it's like let's just kind of build this in be aware of it think about how we're moving and then i'll take that into a level where we are let's take the serratus and my last point on here so we might be if we're getting into some like rotation positions you mentioned that before jacko so it's really useful from a high performing shoulder to be able to have a rotational component so we need to get that that um the, the shoulders moving in like a pepper grinder across the the, the the pelvis so because of where the fascial lines are we'll have serratus actually going down through across the into the obliques on the opposite side so full contraction of um, the fascial sling if you like of that serratus that rhomboid serratus and then down goes wraps around if you think rhomboids from shoulder blade around the rib cage through your serratus anterior which is like your little boxer muscle those fingertips then across the midline to the opposite side hip we can cue all of that in and bring the road and bring an exhalation in at that point to really kind of get that full range of motion and maximize that the integration of that sling so there's like a level of awareness and then there's a level of like optimization if you like through exercise and movement but you've got to know how to breathe first before you can then go and start to implement it into some of those more technical things and there's kind of like levels the game yeah, yeah, My, yeah have i done a good job of explaining yeah. that jacko is that no no i like that because the, the the one sort of final point i wanted to make just on how that how it then influences or allows you to what you're going to do with the shoulder is is the stuff that you're talking about going like ultimately you're going to need to upgrade some strength there's going to be some strength deficits and issues that's come as well you might whether it's serratus whether it's rotator cuff there's a combination of things things in working in, in in synergy together but you're going to want to do some strengthening work um but you want to as we'd always say in anything um training wise you want to build that strength on strong foundations and the foundations to literally your your shoulder your scapula is like what it sat on so the ribs so it's like a case of get yourself in a position like you said to have awareness, be uh, noticing how your your breathing affects your posture and how your posture relief, your positioning of your ribcage affecting that shoulder function to get yourself in a position where you've got some better range of motion, things are moving and gliding nicely so that you can actually then go and upgrade some strength in that system and that's what's going to make you have some sort of like robustness and, and some big wins in like being able to do cool stuff with your actual shoulders. Yeah. There's a couple of cases I've had of people that have one in particular where it was actually a shoulder issue and sort of pain and rotation and side bending was, was a rib cage issue. And it was actually by fixing the ribs and the hips, which then freed up the shoulder. But there's a complicated yeah. one. Yeah. No, for real. Right, that's 40 minutes, Jacko, we've done today. I Lovely. We'll probably go down a couple of holes in that. <laughs> um, so any, if you've got any, uh, any questions on the back of that, just drop them through on email. You can get tim at schoolofcalisthenics.com or david at schoolofcalisthenics.com. Um, any of your calisthenics questions, we're keen to do some more Q&A. So if you've got some questions and you listen to this and thinking, I've got a specific thing that I would like you guys to wax lyrical about, then send that through on um, email for us as well. Um, and if you are interested in either of those two things of how our worlds now collide within calisthenics training, breathing, shoulder specific kind of training and um then just send it through and we will we will funnel your questions to the, to the right person to, yeah. to help you um, is that right yeah that's, that's good fair. as i was say if anyone where tim if they want to find out a bit more specifically around shoulder literally 
they're going, okay, actually, I've got a bit of shoulder pain. I need to sort myself out. What's the best place to just direct them to for that? Uh, so we have dynamic dynamic shoulders dot com, or you can find us on Instagram at dynamic shoulders. Cool, um, pretty straightforward. And Jacko, where might someone find you if they were interested <laughs> yeah, in? Well, <laughs> no, it's on the on the breathing on that on some of those things. That's that sort of wet your appetite. Over there's um, I've got a new app out that's called Pro Breathwork. So you can go to Pro Breathwork dot com. It's on Google or on Apple, and there's a free foundations of breathing course. There's like eight modules that you can work through for free. That's just gonna get those get those basics in place and for most people they don't need anything more than that so uh uh get yourself jumped on that and uh, just get the basics nailed down and and um yeah you're probably not for a lot of people they don't need any more than that obviously if there there is extra stuff in there if people want some additional stuff but generally speaking the basics as ever is what gets people um in a place that they're they're happy to move on pain free you made it free from jack as well what a guy <laughs> Helping the world breathe better. Well, I feel... The thing is... Um, so, the thing what? is, it's like... Breathing's one that... It's, it's breathing sort of, like, is free. It's like a... <laughs> if, but do you know what I mean? It's like one of those, like, essential things of life, or the essential thing yeah, of life. Yeah. Like, well, I feel like that should just... Like, the basics of that, for just, like, being able to do it well, it's the type of thing that we should be like... Why do we not get taught this at school or whatever? And, mm. yeah, so, yeah. That's where it comes from. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Right, thank you for listening this week, guys. I hope that's been useful. Uh, We'll be back next week. But until then, keep exploring your physical potential with movement, strength, and play. Class dismissed. (laughs) 